you, what were you saying? I was, <laughs> I was, I was saying. Uh, All right, mum. Right, there we are. I was saying. I'm an alligator. The 8th of January 1947, Peggy Burns gave birth to David Robert Jones, unknowingly giving life to one of the biggest, most outrageous cultural influences known to date. Bowie's mother had a reputation as a sexual predator and was well known for her coldness and mood swings. Her family history showed a long line of madness and David's mother suffered with a growing tendency to depression and later schizophrenia. As a young boy, David was always surrounded by people who suffered with mental health issues. His aunt Una was referred to an insane asylum, sending her daughter, David's cousin Christina, to stay at the already cramped Jones household. It was reported that Christina's jealousy whilst living with Bowie was too overwhelming. She would punch David until he cried, and as he was learning to walk, every time he stood, she would push him down in fits of hysterical laughter. The only light for Bowie in this strange and dark world was Peggy's bastard son, Terry. But even this, Terry, the manic depressive and schizophrenic who would eventually commit suicide came with his own issues. That strong bond between Bowie and Terry was sweet, but unfortunately wasn't made to last. The companionship, the love, the appreciation was going to be brought to a quick close. He was diagnosed with schizophrenia after attempting to kill himself by jumping out of a window. He was also admitted into psychiatric care at Cane Hill, but later escaped and killed himself by jumping in front of a train at Colston South Station in 1985. Mental health in the 60s and 70s was irrationalised by those who didn't understand it. Things that people see a counsellor for today would have been thrown into a mental asylum had it have been the 70s. They didn't have many other solutions back then other than medication or electroconvulsive therapy. Electroconvulsive therapy is the procedure of small electric currents passed through the brain to intentionally trigger a small seizure. It's done as it changes the brain chemistry to reverse symptoms of mental health. If mental health was treated like it is today, Terry may have lived. Bowie stayed strong for his brother and bled emotion into his music. At the time, Terry was in Cane Hill. David was working on the album, The Man Who Sold the World. The title is pretty self-explanatory and led people to believe the album was heavily influenced by Terry himself. We passed up on the stairs We spoke of was and when So, with the spectre of schizophrenia prevalent throughout his childhood, it's quite clear to see how Bowie later fitted into all of his different personas without getting them mixed up. Ballot, a psychological theorist, had a far development subphase theory that explained how Bowie became profoundly fragmented, later leading to alter egos and intense drug taking. As a 22 year old, Bowie was doing nearly all forms of narcissistic injury upon himself stories of which frequently made the news. David was vulnerable to all kinds of ineffective coping strategies. He was a chain smoker and an addict of everything, whether it be class A's, B's, C's or sex. Um, I just got me leg over a lot. We, we, um, did you have relationships with these people as well, or was it mainly... Not if I could help it. <laughs> Uh, I mean, Let's Dance, I actually, I love that album, I think it's a really good album. Um, and it's the next two after that, I think, were probably their millstones around my neck, and they're awful albums. Um, because I've really lost my, uh, lost my way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we must have died It's no secret that Bowie had issues, but he'd really hit a wall creating the persona of Ziggy Stardust. Didn't know what time 
it was and the lights were low I leaned back on my radio Despite him stealing the hearts and minds of the nation, he ruined the heart and mind of his own. Ziggy became more than just a stage name, he became a part of Bowie. He became his escape. Ziggy helped Bowie channel all of his reckless emotions through the sensational album Ziggy Stardust and the Spiders from Mars. This album told the story of Ziggy landing on planet Earth and his experiences that he encountered. The album got released in 72 while Bowie was dealing with Terry's diagnosis and his own demons alongside it. David was brought into a strange but sadly predictable schizophrenic cocktail of addiction, paranoia and divergent thinking and it was Ziggy that masked it all. Bowie's use of personas was intentionally constructed to distance himself from troubled genetic past but it would in fact bind him to it and it was the music critics that noticed the characters were contradiction after contradiction, losing himself in and amongst it. July the 3rd, 1973, the night Bowie ended Ziggy's life on stage in front of all of his fans. He was said to go back to his dressing room where he spent night after night transforming into his preferred cell, where he closed the door behind him and destroyed the whole place. This was absolutely heart-wrenching. The fans of Ziggy thought they had it bad. David had just lost his escape, his mask, his protection from the cruel realities he had to face as David James. With the death of recent coping mechanism Ziggy Stardust, Bowie was back and on his own and still left to cope with the pain from his childhood. The alien had gone, David Bowie was left to wander alone seeking comfort in cocaine until his next persona manifested itself. In other words, until his next persona helped Bowie internalise his developmental needs. Bowie was then to use each and every upcoming persona to the point of exhaustion and exploitation. He would wring out every single ounce of those personas, making the most of the temporary escapes which were divided and sometimes merged with cocaine addiction. The next of these alter egos would be the Thin White Duke, who proved more toxic than Bowie himself. It wouldn't be completely outrageous for me to say that at the time of the Thin White Duke, Bowie lost a fair chunk of his fan base. What people struggled to understand was that the Thin White Duke was not Bowie. He was an investment of all Bowie's toxic mental traits and bad memories moulded into a scrawny, lanky man, and Bowie knew that. The Duke was also a fiend for cocaine. It was recorded as Bowie's heaviest drug taking period, not only messing up Bowie's career, but his brain too. The Duke was darker than dark, and certainly not what Bowie needed. Everything just fit his persona. Bowie's cry for help was through his changing music. It went from abstract bursts of beauty to solemn explosions of sin and gloom, both equally as amazing. When Bowie was asked to recall the time recording Station to Station as the Thin White Duke, he would state that he had no memory of that year due to the abuse of cocaine. He later admitted for a while he was on a diet of red peppers, cocaine and milk. Bowie almost lost his mind. Stories began surfacing of Bowie losing touch with his sanity. He was said to be seeing bodies fall past his window and he would burn black wax candles in his home while being accompanied by ancient Egyptian artefacts. At one point he even believed that the witches were trying to steal his semen. By the end of this self-abusive year, Bowie was 28, 5 foot 10 and only weighed 45 kilograms. That's seven stone. The Duke had to go. Bowie knew that it was a him or me scenario. Bowie was never to return to role playing after his experience with the Duke. He pushed his sanity to the brink and was not prepared to do it again. This persona was proof of how far Bowie would go to achieve greatness. So much so he nearly lost his mind. Instead he was to move to Berlin to get a grip of his cocaine addiction, but the city just released further demons and pushed him close to the edge. Berlin offered sanctuary from the pressure of being famous, but also the pressure of being himself. Iggy and David were completely wild, and even more so when they were together. 
They were both seen getting immensely intoxicated, falling into gutters and strolling into a variety of different bars. One significant night that Iggy will never forget was when he was in the passenger seat next to mentally unstable Bowie as they repeatedly rammed their drug dealer's car for five continuous crazy minutes. Bowie drove round the hotel's underground car park at 70 mile per hour, screaming that he wanted to end it all by driving into a concrete wall. And this carried on until the car finally ran out of fuel. To defeat his own demons, Bowie needed stability and space which his wife Angie no longer provided. She could no longer deal with Bowie's relentlessness and insanity, meaning their marriage broke down. So instead, his assistant Coco Schwab found him in an apartment in the Art Nova building in Berlin. She ordered into the apartment white walls and blank canvases, and tube after tube of oil paint. Bowie's first painting was of the Japanese author, Yukio Mishima, working as a perfectly healthy distraction. Bowie stayed sober, mostly. He mellowed slightly and focused on making new music, written and produced by Bowie. Not Ziggy, not the Duke, just Bowie. He eventually got himself sorted and became a global superstar, loved by millions and millions of people. Bringing us into his most recent and final album, Black Star. Sometimes there are no words. But we welcomed death like a friend. He embraced every inch of it. To him it was another adventure for the Starman. He left his fans with a parting gift of the album of pure emotion and his upcoming death. The particular song Lazarus left fans in bits. Following his death it was even worse, giving the song a completely different meaning. It was Bowie all over. He couldn't even pass away without him making some sort of statement. And here he left the world in bits. Look up here. I'm in heaven I've got scars that can't be seen I've got drama can't be stolen Everybody knows me now 